and adjust. And just wanted to let everybody know, we're gonna post a little bit in the chat, but we're gonna do a little introduction. So you will um, have all the information that you need today. So we just wanna welcome you to this program of the University of Arkansas Small Business and Technology Development Center. We are always pleased to be able to bring you educational programs that support small businesses. We want you to be advised that this conversation is being recorded for ASB TDC purposes only. And um, we will be uh, posting, you'll be able to see this recording and all of our other past workshops and links at our website. And we'll be posting those links in the chat as we go. I'm gonna introduce Allison momentarily, um, but first I'd like to introduce us and tell you a little bit about ASB TDC. I am Amy Robinson. I'm a specialty consultant with the Small Business Center and with me today is Chris Case, our colleague. Um, if you don't know about the Small Business Center, it is a one-stop shop for startups and existing small businesses. We are associated with the University of Arkansas and we are affiliated with the SBA as well as the statewide ASB TDC. As, and we are also part of a network of more than a thousand small business centers across the U.S. So you'll be able to find one of us somewhere, anywhere that you are. Locally, we offer complimentary, that's the right, complimentary one-on-one -on -one consulting programs, uh, consulting services, as well as these programs that color, color, uh, cover relevant topics. We want you to encourage um, you to visit us at, at sbtdc.uark.edu. If you are not already a client, you can just click get a consultation. Um, and if you are a client, um, um, then please contact us at the information that you see on your screen. After the presentation, again, you can find this and our future programs um, at the website. So we hope you'll visit us soon. Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about what we've got going on today. Hey, great, thanks, Amy. So today we're bringing you how to be your own HR department, human resource essentials for small businesses, which we get a lot of questions about almost daily. So um, Allison is gonna give us a lot of great information there. Now we do love this format because it gives you an, all an opportunity to talk with the experts, ask questions, and even work through some challenges that you might be having currently in your small businesses. Now this is very interactive. So we encourage you to ask questions as we go along. And you can do that a couple ways. You can either mute yourself and we will see the little light go on around your square and, and know that you have a question to be asked or you can also raise your hand or put um chat you can always chat with us and and we can either answer the questions as we go along or we'll save them for the end to ask um, to answer those questions but um please again it's very interactive so ask as many questions as you can and allison will fill us in on all the details yeah. okay so amy back to you yeah, so we absolutely yeah. uh, love a good conversation. And um, as you know, today you are here, if you wanna do the next uh, slide, Chris, um, we are here to talk about how to be your own HR department. Um, and we have Allison Malone with us. Allison is a career HR professional and she's also a specialty consultant with ASB TDC and has been with us since March. So she's been helping a lot of companies through the pandemic and, and navigating a lot of these issues. She's also, has an executive coaching and uh, leadership coaching business and you can find her at alisonmalone.com and as well as Allison Malone Consulting on Facebook. So as we get to know Allison a little bit here in just a moment, we would like to invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself. So if you will post in the chat um, just to us or to everyone, um, if you want to be on the down low, you can send it to me or Chris, um, but let us know about what industry you're in. And if you have a specific question or something that you'd like to talk to Allison about, we just like to get to know you. Um, it helps her with examples to know kind of what industry you're in or what you're curious about today. And uh, we'll call on you later if you wanted to ask her yourself. So, Allison, um, we are here today because as a small business owner doing it all, um, we want to know about the hiring life cycle from job descriptions to handbooks and performance reviews um, and the fact that they could cost you time and money um, if you don't have them in place. So we want to learn a little bit more from you about how you can avoid the pitfalls of hiring to firing, um, but also just about improving your business culture and bottom line overall. So, I'm going to turn it over to you to launch into all of that. All the things. Thank you, Amy and Chris, for the perfect introduction. I really absolutely have really have nothing to add. 
Um, Amy and Chris have really teed this up pretty well. And uh, when Amy says we're going to talk about things from the employment life cycle perspective, uh, that really means if you, you know, um, from, a, from a timeline perspective, sort of what would you need to do um, all the way before you need an employee to hiring an employee to giving some feedback and performance uh, um, information to an employee of handling poor performance all the way to when you have to part ways with an employee. Um, so that's what we mean by the employment life cycle. So I will start at the beginning and uh, we'll do frequent pauses. I think Chris and Amy will be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and then we can take a look. I see a few folks are posting sort of industries and that sort of thing. So I do want to make sure I am hitting topics that are relevant for your businesses, your size, your industry, uh, how long you have uh, been in business and those sort of things. So I think what I'll do is start first and foremost, as you can see with the first slide, with job descriptions. Um, what I recommend, if possible, is to create that job description really before in anticipation of hiring somebody. Um, if you already have somebody on board and you don't have a job description for him or her, that's fine. You can go ahead and create one. It's, it's really not that big of a deal. But basically, what a job description is, what you would use them for, it really is um, a plain language tool and document that explains the basics, you know, the tasks, the duties, the assignments, the responsibilities uh, for a particular position. Um, and you would use a job description really for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, you could and should really be thinking about how can you even demonstrate your organization's culture, uh, how, how you're setting salary levels, conducting performance reviews, clarifying your mission, uh, establishing titles. Uh, it's useful for career planning, uh, where and when you might offer training. But for me, I think the personally, the most important reason to have a job description really is in expectation setting. So and even really before you hire someone, what is expected of them, what their job responsibilities are, how the company or the organization will measure performance. Um, it really gives the employee a clear, concise resource um, for an overview and outline for job performance. So it's a tool that you can really use with your employees to make sure they're meeting your job um, expectations. So in terms of kind of what's included in a job description, basically, and, and many of you have probably seen them, you'll see an overview or a summary section that just highlights what the job is, maybe in like one or two sentences. Some of the knowledge, skills, and abilities to be successful in the position. If there's any physical attributes or physical aspects to the job, standing, sitting, cold temperatures, lifting, uh, lifting, you know, X amount of weight, that sort of a thing. Um, I think, and then any experience, education, credentials, certifications that you need to be, uh, that are required for the job. Um, and I think the, the other thing that's important is you would want to use the exact same format and whatever format that is you choose to use for all your different positions. Um, so this should be consistent. Um, and then... I think, you know, if you don't have job descriptions, one of the headaches that you might see is just some misaligned expectations. Um, so that's the basics on job descriptions. I'm going to go ahead and take a pause and see if folks have any questions. All right. We'd love to just want to make questions. We've got a couple of um, people have chimed in about kind of the industries that they're in um, a franchise service business in Northwest Arkansas. So franchise, definitely um, new, lots of rules and regulations. You probably even have um, some templates for some of the things that, um, that we're talking about today. And then a uh, telecom and technology group that works with clients um, in aspects of telecommunications and technology um, that, um, that they're probably uh, maybe a little bit later on when we talk about the different types of uh, employees and contractors, that might be a good 
topic to talk about. Those are the couple of the industries that we have so far. Um, anyone else have any questions for Allison here and now? Feel free to unmute, ask yourself, or post it in the chat. Yeah, and I agree with Amy. The franchise, I would be surprised if they did not have some of these tools and templates in place already. Uh, this is Tommy Davis. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, this is not relevant to my business, but I think um, uh, in light of the, the pandemic and the work at home and things that have changed over the past year, I think whenever we're dealing with changes in job descriptions or responsibilities, duties, or how we're doing things, it's important for us to really look at modifying those job descriptions so that we just don't assume our folks know what those changes are. Um, pandemic. pandemic specific, yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yep, now we gotcha. All right, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so the other place that you can address some of those changes in, in um, you know, where the work gets performed might also be in your policy handbook. Um, and so you might create a working remote policy that is either permanent or temporary. I think we've seen folks um, handle it that way as well. We will get to policies, procedures, and handbooks in a bit. Okay, I will quickly cover uh, the very not exciting um, employee paperwork and compliance. And there's, there's a few basics that I think most employers, if not all, need. Uh, first and foremost is the I-9 form. Um, and that, that is something that all employers, no matter how big or small, they must complete an I-9 on all employees um, and it really is uh, verifying their eligibility to work in the US. And there's just a couple key points with making sure that you are correctly filling out the I-9. So the employee completes the first section and presents acceptable documents per the I-9 form within the first three days of employment. And I think the most important thing to talk about with these documents that they can present, if you, there's, a, there's numerous pages to the form I-9 and one of them, is uh, a list of acceptable, acceptable documents. And they can present either one document from column A um, or a, a document from column B and C. And it is their choice. They can choose any of those documents. So where I see people getting into a little bit of trouble with the I-9 is to say, oh, just bring in your driver's license and your birth certificate. Uh, it's, it's not, um, appropriate to tell them what documents to bring in. I always send the, the employee the form and say, your choice, please either bring in a document from A or one from B and C. So that is a place I've seen people go a little bit astray with the I-9. Um, you do not, as an employer, you're not required to keep photocopies of the employee documents. Um, many, 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 many companies do, but it is not a requirement. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, it can be a bit of a risk if you're keeping a copy of someone's um, uh, passport or driver's license. Security is pretty important. Um, and the other thing with the I-9 is it must be stored someplace in a secure location. So if you have just a handful of employees in a locked drawer or file cabinet, um, those are the key things with a form I-9, that is not something that gets filled out for an independent contractor. This is just your actual employee. I would imagine most of you are familiar with the W-4. It is the tax form. There is a federal form and a state form. You can find these and the I-9 form just online. Um, and last but not least is the labor posters. Um, those also, you can, you can find those on the Department of Labor's website. If you print things off from there, you'll get like, I don't even know, 20 plus various um, employment pieces of paper. My recommendation would be just to find a company that will do that all in one laminated form and it's state specific. So that's it. Questions or anything on paperwork and compliance. Just a quick question in case we do have anybody, and I know that you're going to cover contractors a little while later, and um, there's a different form for contractors than the, um, than the W-4 or the I-9. 
um, and is that able to be found um, through the IRS, the 1099? Yeah, I, you just literally Google it. Yes, I've completed. I am a contract employee or a contractor for many different organizations, and they always have you fill out a new um, 1099. Mm -hmm. And that's there as well. Awesome. Okay, so the employee handbook. Um, basically, the employee handbook really is just a place for you to concisely and all in one spot, put all your various policies, procedures, practices, um, and those would include things um, and, and Hey everybody, are we back? <laughs> no, we're not back yet. Uh, let's see. I don't see Allison and Chris isn't uh, coming back. We'll wait just a moment to um, get everybody back on. We have gremlins today. Yes. Not just with the Zoom, but with some other. We will get attendees back as well. We are just having mass across the board Zoom issues today. We do have yeah, all over the place. We can will get everybody me? back here momentarily. Yes. Now we can hear you. There we go. Almost, we almost, there we go. I see you, Chris. I, can't see you. Chris will get us back I, to uh, where we were. I did lose um, an attendee or two, so hopefully they'll be able to come back with us. There, my screen's backed up. Can there you see go. that, Alice? Yes, I can see everything. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, Julia, if you'll send them a message. Back on. Yeah. There we go. Boy, there's a first yep. for everything. This Absolutely. is a good, this is a first. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, I know we have gone through the entire pandemic doing these on basically a daily basis. And this is the first that we've had a big crash. So that's awesome. <laughs> All right, Allison, where were we? <laughs> we were talking about the ever fun, ever exciting employee handbook. Maybe that is All why right. we we're ready to pick um, up. We're good. I think we're on the right slide. So I was just saying, you know, depending upon the size of your organization will depend upon some of the policies and federal guidelines that you would include. Um, I think I was saying, you know, for a larger company, 50 and more employees, you would have to have a family and medical leave policy. If you have 15 or more employees, you would have an Americans with Disabilities Act policy. Um, but basically, some of the basic things that you might see in an employee handbook um, are things like uh, background checks, dress code if that is appropriate, um, time, you know, your hours of operation, those sorts of things. 
Um, and I think at the, the tail end, I would certainly recommend uh, a disclaimer where you basically say something to the effect that this handbook is not considered to be a contract for continued employment. Um, an at will policy statement stating we are in an at will employer. It, at any time. Um, sorry, can you guys hear me? Can you all hear me? You. Okay, yes, sorry. I can. We got the whole slides went away. Apologies there. No. So, and I think this is, you know, normally where I would talk about things like considering things like a work from home or remote work policy, depending upon your organization. Again, that can be a temporary or a permanent change based on the pandemic, certainly. You would include your company's equity, diversity, and inclusion policies. Um, and additional topics you might see in an employee handbook are things like exempt and non-exempt schedules, breaks, how to track your hours, maybe payroll procedures, if you offer benefits, an overview of that, um, any disciplinary language. Um, basically, I would include that at a high level, I advise against posting a progressive discipline policy that states we will give two written, two verbal warnings, one written warning and a final warning before termination. And the reason I um, suggest not having a formal progressive discipline policy is it tends to tie your hands. So there may be cases where you don't want to follow every single step like that in, in the case of something more egregious. Um, by that, I don't mean uh, that you should just fire people out of the gate. I do think you should speak to folks and then follow up in writing and then give a final chance. All I'm saying is I would not state it in such a way in your employee handbook. Uh, probably the biggest mistake I see in an employee handbook and really the biggest missed opportunity is folks who take an employee handbook that either um, a friend's company or organization has or one that they found on the internet and just uh, copy paste or replace their company name for yours. This really is a place to um, kind of shine your company culture. I also think a place where companies can go astray is that they have too many policies. Um, so I will say this, if you have a policy in your handbook, you must follow it. So I would say proceed with caution. You can always update, you can always add policies and it really depends upon the kind of an organization and the kind of culture you have and that you want to build. I have worked for companies that are more formal and have more formal policies and ones that are slightly more informal. Thoughtful to think about what it is you're trying to uh, portray with your company culture and really truly what policies do you really need. I find in an organization when an issue has come up a few times, it gives me pause and I think, hmm, we have had, for example, people posting things inappropriately on the internet or on social media. Maybe it's time for a social media policy. So that in my mind is how these policies evolve. Um, so I think, again, the other place to caution that I want to highlight one more time is if you have a policy in your handbook, you must follow it. So keep that in mind. So Question. Allison, um, I just was going to take a pause here and yes, open for questions. Uh, one of the things that I hear you saying is kind of less is more, um, live the question and kind of live into your handbook, start with, with some very, very basic stuff. But then as things start coming up or if things become an issue, you can, you can always add, but it's really hard to take things out once they're there and written. Um, so how do you, if you don't just copy a template online or, um, you know, take one from another company, um, how do you, how do you start with that? Is there a, is it even just like topics or a base, basic framework um, for people to, to follow that, um, that you would recommend? Yeah. And I think you can start with one that you find online. I think the key is to start there and then think about just don't fully copy it. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the places I find is, is even in the tone. 
you know, I have uh, joined organizations that um, are trying to appeal maybe to a younger employee and have sort of a flippant tone to it. And I think you have to be a little bit careful. This is a serious document um, and it is policies and procedures and that is a little bit dry, but I think you've got to really finesse it in a way that makes sense for your organization. So I think starting with something that you find online is okay. Um, and then, you know, literally start crossing stuff out like, okay, this is an XYZ policy on, I don't even know, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, let's just use Family and Medical Leave Act. Okay, well, we, we, we aren't even big enough to be covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act. Let's cut that out. Or um, our companies and, and clients confidentiality and confidentiality and privacy is critically important to us. So we wanna make sure and highlight a policy on that. So I think the place to start are those federal requirements, your EEO policy, your anti-discrimination policy um, and things like that. Um, and it is okay to start with somebody else's handbook, but just to be very thoughtful and heavily edit. Excellent, any other questions while we're, while we're here? Before we move on to the right people, anybody have questions on the dry stuff? <laughs> you make it fun, Allison, as fun as possible. All right, well, be sure to, um, you can throw any question in the chat as we're going along. So feel free to do that if anything comes up or um, if we need to go back to anything, it's all good. All right. Okay, Thanks, so, so bringing in additional help, we'll call it that to start with. So it really will cover things like independent contractors and hiring employees. So what is an independent contractor and how does that look a little bit different than an employee? Um, an independent contractor is outsourced work on a project by project basis. So it gives an employer specific expertise as needed. For example, someone like me, human resources support. Um, I contract for several different organizations. Maybe you need to hire a web designer to create your website. Uh, maybe it's some accounting assistant, a hire or to engage with a web designer or accounting assistants. Uh, maybe you need someone to periodically run social media marketing for you. Many of those can be in an independent contractor capacity. Generally, independent contractors own their own businesses and have many clients or at least more than one client. Uh, they're given particular projects versus a specific direction or tools on how to do the project. So a perfect and clear example of an independent contractor is when you hire a plumber. You would call a plumber to fix, say, a leaky faucet or a broken toilet you have in your house. The plumber owns his or her own business. They show up with their tools when it's convenient for them, um, and they, they fix it in the way in which... Um, they see fit. You don't supply the wrenches and tell them to come at nine and leave at five and how to, you know, and what, how to fix your toilet. That is an independent contractor. Um, if you need someone to run your cash register or interact with your customers during, on a set schedule during certain days of the week and certain hours, that's an employee. So that to me is sort of the best way to understand the difference between an independent contractor and an employee. I will pause for questions. Are there any um, benefits um, for, is there any kind of phasing? So could somebody that maybe starts out as an independent contractor turn into an employee? And, um, and when it comes to kind of those outlines of those contracts, is there anything that you recommend that people do as far as expectations or um, what we know as scope of work? Um, is there anything that you recommend um, that they do with an independent contractor versus something that they would do um, with an employee? You know, I think it depends. With the independent contractor, some folks will have things like uh, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and just a work agreement. Um, you know, you're here to um, and, and maybe we're cutting in and out a little bit, so we'll get her to pick up where we left off. Is she cutting out for you too, Chris? Yes. Okay. Well, one, one question I had. 
for you, Amy, um, too, and you might be able to answer this and if Allison's back on there, but, you know, with a contractor, how I kind of see it with companies is it's kind of a finite project. It's got a start date and an end date a lot of times. And then when they transfer or um, move into becoming a full-time client or um, employees when that is extended, but that's kind of how I see a contractor. It's usually a finite start and, and end date to it. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Can you guys hear me again? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yes. Now we got you. Yeah. I'm back. Bye. Yeah, Chris, just pick up <laughs> <laughs> when I fade out. Okay. Other other questions. Otherwise, I'll I'll kind of hit where we might find some of these employees. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So really quickly, um, the thing that you will need to hire somebody or find folks who might be interested in your open positions is through a job posting. Um, hold on, sorry. So you might have luck with your job posting on places like, and it depends on what kind of an employee you're looking for, but Craigslist or Indeed or your company's webpage or your company's social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, likely and perhaps your best future employee is a, is a client or a customer. Um, so consider asking your best customers who they know for your open roles. I think my best piece of advice for these job postings is to be clear and to be concise with the, can with the posting so that your candidate knows exactly what the role is. The whole point of the job posting is to attract your ideal candidate. So it's important to be honest and open with what the role requires and what your organization is like. Um, my advice would be to put yourself in the job seeker's shoes as you write this post. What might they be thinking? What might they be feeling? What might they be searching for? And you really, this, this job posting is not taking your job description and popping it online. That is a sure way to get people to completely stop reading and click on to the next thing. You really wanna write the post in a way that your company culture shines through. Um, and it's an opportunity to show your potential job applicants how your organization is different from all the other ones posted out there. So talk about your culture. Is it fun? Is it collaborative? Is it competitive? Find a way to get this across while your job description might be a little dull, your job posting should not be boring. Um, give candidates a realistic sense of what they'll be doing day to day. If the phones ring nonstop, you need to include that in your job posting. Is it quiet? Post about that. Is it fast paced? Be honest. So if you think about this job posting as a marketing tool to attract your candidates and not a carbon copy of your job description, which is an internal document, that's your best way to take a, take a look at the difference. Every single thing that's on the job description does not need to be on your job posting. They're two very different documents with very different purposes. So let's pause there. This is a place I find, and, and the way to create the job posting may, is probably to start with your job description, but you're pairing it way back. You're having a very different tone um, and you're really writing it from a marketing perspective. Well, so and Allison, one of the things- yeah, well, I was just going to say, I think we're reading each other's mind right there, because one of the things that we've talked about a lot is the tables have kind of turned, you know, instead of us interviewing people for the jobs, a lot of people are interviewing us to make sure that it's a right fit. And so people are interviewing the company. And I think you've got to kind of get in that mindset a little bit. And I think that was what you were just about to say. Absolutely. We are hearing from our clients pretty much every day that they are having a difficult time hiring employees. So it, that's exactly right. The tables have turned and it is it is the employer's job to sell what they've got. You're selling your organization, you're selling uh, your culture, you're selling the experience, you're selling, you know, kind of you're not selling the steak, but you're selling the sizzle. I think that's probably the way I would describe it. Questions? I don't see any questions in the chat, Amy, do you? Nope, I don't. I think you're covering everything so far. Everybody go ahead and feel free to post anything at any point, but so far so good. Yeah, I think what I would say about picking your best candidate 
Uh, one of the tips, and I've just seen this fairly recently, is I would advise folks to make it as easy as possible for your job candidates and potential employees to apply for the position. You want a click, you want uh, them to submit a resume, if that makes sense for your industry or the level that you're hiring for. I would not suggest asking for a cover letter, but you could say, Give, tell us in two sentences why we should hire you. Maybe that's all it is. Maybe you don't even need or require a resume. The more hoops you make folks jump through, the more people are going to fall out earlier and earlier in the process. So I think that is my first, probably most important piece of advice is at this point and in this job market, make it easy for people to apply to your positions. Um, when you start interviewing, I uh, wouldn't be afraid to ask the person why he or she wants the job and what they know about your organization. Um, a simple tell me about yourself is a great way to see what someone's communication skills are like and um, see what they know about your organization. If you find that someone asks you what your organization does, uh, it's a red flag. They've done 0.0, .0 homework and might not be your ideal candidate. Um, I would think long and hard if you've got someone in the role now or have recently had someone in a role that's been successful, think about the attributes that they have and what's made them successful. What's led to their success? Are they flexible? Are they reliable? Do they take initiative? What are the things that have made them successful? And then interview your candidates based on that. Uh, the other thing I think that is probably my number one tip is to treat your candidates how you would want to be treated during the interview process. So what does that mean? Uh, create a process for them. Tell them the steps you're going to take. Tell them when they're going to hear back from you and then follow up. Do what you say you're going to do. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I have many a time applied for a job and then felt like my resume, my application, and the whole conversation has fallen into the black hole. Um, I would say do not do that. If somebody um, submits a resume or applies online and they're not a fit, an email or electronic DM, whatever vehicle they use to apply response is fine. If you have talked to someone or interviewed them in person, um, my recommendation is to um, get back in touch with them over the phone. So I think that's probably my most important tip. Before I move on, questions about your job postings, interviewing, do's, don'ts, where you might find some of these folks. And I guess the other thing I would say is be creative. Yeah. Allison, to pop in here, one of the things I've seen, you know, all of us are consultants and we've been consulting businesses for years. But one of the things that I see the pitfalls is we hire people just like ourselves. So we have a bunch of Chris cases running around, which is not a good idea, by the way. So try to try to fit the, the person to that job rather than to your own individual needs as a leader or owner. Yes. Of, or yes. personality. And, and, yeah. Yes. Yep, complimentary skills. If you are big picture, high level, and you might want to find someone who's good with the details. Yeah, I would. I would love to hear if anybody is um, has hired in the past and what some of the um, experiences that you've had um, or lessons that you've learned. I think that uh, one of the best things we can do is learn from each other and learn from our um, past mistakes. So I'd love um, to hear from anybody about something that worked for you or if you've had an experience where something didn't work for you. Um, if you're new to all of this, of course, I'm sure you're sitting there and absorbing it all. But um, yeah, we'd love to, uh, to hear from you as well on, on what's working for you. I've heard uh, on occasion, sometimes um, people will have, depending on what kind of business you're in, um, phased approaches. So they'll kind of have like a, a preliminary interview. Um, people will sometimes give homework and ask for a presentation. Um, sometimes they do uh, specifically a culture interview um, to kind of um, meet other team members and have other people in on the on the interview um, phase or conversation. Um, I think that you know it depends on how much time you have, how many team members you have, um, but I've heard of that as well, and and just kind of making it a little bit longer than that, that one time. Um, what about Allison? Um, on, we've also talked to people about doing phone interviews before they do the in-person interview. Um, how well do you think that that works? 
Well, you know, it's interesting, Amy, one of the pieces of feedback we've heard a lot lately, um, which I have never heard before uh, consistently, is that you've um, scheduled an interview and people are consistently not showing up for the interviews. So I do think uh, phone interviews, phone screens, um, texting some basic questions. I mean, we are suggesting things that are a little different than we have in the past, um, scheduling people back to back to back to back to, um, to make sure, you know, setting a lot of what we're hearing from our. Yeah, one of the things that another one that we've had a client do is to um, send somebody a list of questions. And if they didn't get answers, written answers to those questions back, then they didn't move forward um, to to an in-person or even phone interview. So there are definitely some, um, some vetting, uh, for lack of a better term, um, processes uh, that you can go through to just make sure somebody's really deeply interested in the job. Yep, I would agree. I would agree. Okay, I will move on to day one. So we're going to assume that you have found your ideal candidate, you have hired him or her, and it is time for day one. Um, and I think day one is a critical day. Um, it is important to onboard uh, your new employee for whatever kind of a position that is. Um, and my best tip really is uh, be prepared like demonstrate that you actually expected the person to show up on that day. So that means, uh, depending upon what kind of a job or a role they have, having a desk, having a workstation, having a computer, having a phone, uh, or, or whatever it is, depending upon the kind of a job that they will be doing. Um, have sort of that at least first half of a day planned? Is it a training? Is it shadowing? Is it filling out the paperwork, going over the handbook, introducing the candidate, the new hire to the people in the office or the workspace, um, showing them around what's where, where do they find supplies? How do they use, find the restroom? I mean, all the basics. I don't know about other folks on this call, but I have had jobs where I'm certain they completely forgot that I was starting on a certain day. Uh, no boss there. You know, the boss is on a vacation or a business trip or something. I've been left manuals from previous conferences to read on my first day. Things like this have happened so long ago in my career that it seems odd I would remember it, but it was so bad. It really stands out. So there really is like no second chance on making a first impression. So I think it is important to thoughtfully think about how to treat your folks on day one so that they are enthusiastic, loyal, and really want to come back for day two and not head for the hills at lunchtime. Um, so I think that is critical. In terms of offer letters and references, um, we really didn't cover that, but I will, um, I would suggest if you are doing offer letters to do them consistently for everyone. And the reason to do it really is just to formalize the job, the pay, the hours, and just to serve as a welcome. Uh, references, um, up to you. I find that it's pretty difficult to get much information out of a, a former um, boss or company. Again, if you're gonna do them, I would um, do them for everybody, but likely all you're going to get is someone who will verify the dates of employment, past salary, and like, you know, position title. So they're not, you're highly unlikely to get whether, um, you know, so-and-so was a good employee, showed up, was tardy, or those sorts of things. So they tend to not be super helpful. Okay. I think we're ready. Yes. How do I keep good people? Um, probably one more slide, Amy. Okay, so communication. Uh, and I would say communication, communication, communication. This is critical. Um, and the style that you use, yes, you would want to align that with your organization's culture. Um, and, and really, it, feedback needs to be really a regular thing. And I think oftentimes, when folks hear the word feedback, like the hair on the back of your neck stands up, it feels kind of cringy. Um, I guess my best advice here, and I feel like Amy and Chris will be quick to chime in, but avoiding feedback and not addressing things that need to be addressed 
100% does you no favors, it does your company no favors, and it does your employees, the one who needs the feedback and all the rest of them watching, it does them all a disservice. So as a boss, as a manager, as a business owner, and really as a human being and coworker, it is literally your job to give feedback, to have communication, good, bad, and otherwise. I mean, it's just an essential ingredient for the long-term success really of the organization and of these business relationships. So my advice here would be to make it the norm that uh, communication and feedback shouldn't be a once a year, big, scary, crazy event, but that it just happens regularly. Um, you know, positive and negative feedback are important because it really, it helps break bad habits. It reinforces positive behavior and it enables your team to work more effectively towards their goals. So some tips on feedback. The first is to give it timely. So if you observe some behavior, let's just say someone's not showing up on time for their shift, um, it's not all that effective three weeks later to say, oh yeah, you're not coming in on time. Like it is very important to address that quickly and timely and to be specific and to give some examples. I think that helps people understand what it is you're talking about. Um, my advice would be to have regular one-on-ones with your employees. Um, and one-on-ones, and, and by regular, it depends. It could be weekly, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly. It really just depends upon how often the employee works, what your organization is like. If you find that you've scheduled weekly one-on-ones and you have absolutely nothing to talk about, try every other week. If that still feels too frequent, try monthly. Um, and it is sort of a trial and error. Um, and I think my most, yeah, Allison, go ahead. I was just gonna, on the one-on-ones, um, I was wondering if, uh, you know, one of the things I think it provides is an opportunity to also give positive feedback. There's kind of like that three to one rule, like give three, you know, three pieces of positive advice to the one that is gonna be critical because that way, every time you come to them, they're not like, oh, I'm in trouble again. Um, and so one, setting it up as, as that regular and, you know, maybe you don't have a lot to talk about. Maybe you just chat and get to know with who they are and how they're doing, or maybe you're just like, hey, I noticed this really cool thing. And, and like you said, it doesn't have to be more than, you know, 15 minutes. It's just a, it's a check-in. Those are awesome. Yes, I totally agree. And you can also ask what can you do to, as the manager or the boss or the whatever, what can you be doing to help, you know, um, to make that feedback? <laughs> yes. So we're sure. harder. <laughs> yes. I think what, what I would say that one of the most important components besides just doing it is to not cancel that. Um, I have had bosses where I've had one-on-one say, I don't know, monthly and every single time without fail, they would cancel on me. And it really just makes the employee feel like they're not valued. So do not cancel. And for the love of who knows what, don't be on your phone, don't be distracted, put the phone away and just focus. And if you find that really they only need to be 10 minutes, have it be 10 minutes. Um, so I think that is critical. I wonder, Chris, um, one of the things that I think is hard with feedback is, um, is just conflict avoidance in general. And I know that you deal with that a lot. Do you have any tips on, on conflict, how to, in addition to the timeliness of it, because obviously time goes by and then it's not relevant anymore. Um, you have any uh, deep breathing techniques or anything that you... <laughs> What is the mental place and deep breath? <laughs> no, I, I I think we we all if we stick to the facts and not make it emotional and like Allison said, you know, if somebody does something that that you need to address, address it right then. A lot of us don't want to because we don't want the conflict. It's not a good time. It's not a good uh, day for that. It doesn't matter. As a leader and as an owner of your own business, you've got to address it immediately. Um, stick to the facts and leave emotion out of it. And again, if emotion does seep in, maybe you take a walk with that individual. Maybe you, you know, sit down for a cup of coffee, but you have got to address it immediately. I think that's key. And that actually is easier. It just gets worse if you it's, delay. It does. Like anything else, if you're upset about something, think about you know, it happens again. You just, it keeps escalating. And the more you get upset, you know, the more you let it go, the more you get upset, the more emotion is added to it. So, you know, handle it when it's little instead of it turning into something big. All right, Amy, I think one slide forward, if you wouldn't mind. 
do. So I'm just gonna cover this very broadly. Um, I think the thing to think about with a performance review, just like your employee handbook, is don't just copy somebody else's. Um, in my opinion, the things that you review might be different at different organizations. So the way I like to think about it is if you could just in your organization rate somebody on say five things, what are the most important five things in your organization? Is it um, communication, innovation, productivity, customer service? Like what is critical to your business success Review people on those things and call it good. Like a three-page performance review with like 10 different options for levels of performance is just not needed. I would say the more simpler, the better. Um, so simple, simple. Okay, and then we've really kind of covered poor performance and, and uh, you know, with just addressing feedback. But I think, you know, some of the keys here are not to delay, don't make excuses. If you are in, find yourself in that performance, poor performance meeting, I would not ask about how the person's weekend was or what movies they've seen to avoid that small talk and really just get to the point of the conversation. It will just be awkward, it'll be more awkward. Um, following up in writing is important and following up in writing can really even look like an email to say, hey, Chris, on XYZ date, we met, we talked about these things, we agreed to this course of action, and then we will meet again on XYZ date. Uh, providing examples like we talked about, and, and really to think about addressing poor performance as, as an opportunity to help, that you want to help this person succeed. It's important in these conversations to state what you've observed, the poor performance or the behaviors, but also to listen and give the employee an opportunity to talk, tell his or her side of the story, and you may pick up some clues as to why they're underperforming. Um, set expectations and agreements for moving forward, setting a time to meet in the future, um, and then really do follow up and meet in the future. So I think for most, the goal of these conversations is really to enable the employee to make the needed improvements so that they can succeed in your organization. Um, and then last but not least, if you are all the way to termination, it really shouldn't be a surprise. Um, it's important that these are conversations you've had already, unless of course it's something egregious like theft, in which case you don't give like three warnings about theft, you just move to termination. So it's, so in most cases, no surprises, prepare and have a private meeting location. If you don't have a private office, as Chris suggested, you're probably going to have to meet offsite somewhere, coffee shop, a park or something like that. Um, make sure that the thing you are terminating someone for is in the handbook or not, a, not contrary to what's in your handbook. Thinking about precedence, what have you, has been caused for termination for others in the past. My advice would be to have somebody in this meeting with you as a witness, a note taker of that sort of a thing. Um, meeting in person too, if at all humanly possible, if you have employees that are remotely located or in other states, obviously that would be over the phone. Um, giving them an opportunity to talk and tell their story. There's a chance you might learn information that you don't know. And my advice about what to say to other employees is to keep it very high level that so-and-so has moved on. And that's it. I love it. Allison, so just kind of recapping a little bit, maybe even a scenario. So let's just say that you do have regular um, touch bases and maybe they're just 10 or 15 minutes and, and you're good about doing that. How often would you do a performance review um, in, in that situation? And or is there a different formula for a performance review if you don't do regular touch bases? Um, well, you know, you can do whatever. I would say whatever makes sense for your organization's performance review. Uh, sometimes you will find with a new employee that you decide to do like a 90 day written review. I couldn't, I, I would say the more the better. You could do them quarterly. You know, there's, there's once a year really is a quite a long stretch. Um, your policy might be to do quarterly reviews or touch bases or written reviews. And 
once a year, you would um, consider salary increases. So it really can be whatever makes sense. My general and personal opinion is sort of the more, the more the better. You know, if you feel like doing a written review will force you to have a communication around performance, do it quarterly. You know, there, there's no reason not to. Um, and if your form is short, sweet, concise, and really just measuring the most important things in your organization, it shouldn't take too terribly long. In a performance review, and I know that we're talking about small business and you want to keep it simple. Um, do you ever re recommend, you know, them kind of pre-filling out their own review, like how they're doing and then kind of having that conversation together? Is that pretty common? I think that happens certainly upon occasion with a self-review. I think, you know, a reason to do that is to just see what the gaps are. Like if I think I'm a superstar in all things and Amy, you're my boss and you think I'm terrible at all things, that's kind of alarming that there's that big of a gap. Um, so yeah, you certainly can have an employee fill it out. I think with a small, simple, short form, it's probably not necessary. You can certainly ask, how do you think you're doing? You know, that's certainly a conversation. Um, uh, I had one more thought now I've lost it. Um, Okay, I don't remember what it was. Um, Welcome to the world. Um, <laughs> all the time. What um, What about um, bringing somebody else into the conversation? You've mentioned this in in the termination. Um, when you're kind of when you're kind of trying to work with somebody, and you know something is repeating itself or any of those things, would you bring somebody in, um, another employee or anything like that, at a at an earlier phase, just so you have a third set of ears on that um, on I, that situation? You don't. Uh, the reason I don't is because it can feel intimidating. You know, you're two against one. It feels yeah. um, very confrontational. I think I do think for just your general feedback performance review, that should be a place for just the manager and the employee, in my opinion. Um, I, I do think certainly if you've all the way to termination, it makes sense to have another set of eyes and ears. But I think just general feedback, good, bad or otherwise, probably can be handled between the two. I just think it feels a bit intimidating to have more than one. Excellent. And documentation, documentation, documentation. What do you recommend that, you know, like you'd mentioned in the handbook, kind of keeping it kind of living into that, but how much of any of these um, uh, do you feel like need to be documented? I think it can really be as simple as a note in your calendar. It can be a follow-up email. Hey, we've had this conversation, um, you know, talked about these three things. I mean, you know, if keep in mind these conversations, even though they are meant to be regular and normal course of business can be nerve wracking for employees. So sometimes, honestly, they're not going to remember what you said um, because they're a little nervous. So I don't think it's ever a bad idea to follow up with this as simple as an email. Hey, enjoyed our conversation today. Just wanted to follow up with an email. We talked about this, this and this being great and, you know, working on X, Y and Z. Uh, look forward to talking to you again on XYZ date. It can really be as simple as a follow-up email so that everybody's on the same page. They are clear about what it was you said. And also you've got some documentation, you know, if you need it. Yeah. And I think Allison, the last thing I heard from you is that just consistency and follow through. I love what you talked about, you know, how you, as an employee, you don't feel important if the meetings get moved or you forget that they're even going to be there in the first place that day. And, um, and that that really is um, a message of the kind of culture you're going to be setting and what kind of leader you're going to be. And so that's, that's really, really good advice. Love it. Well, we're going to go ahead and, um, close everything out. Um, if anybody has, we've got, you know, just a minute um, to go if anybody has anything. Otherwise, we want to um, thank you all again for being here. I want to remind you that as an attendee of the conversation, you'll be emailed a copy of this presentation. I mentioned that in the chat a little bit earlier. So you'll have all of these um, great notes that Allison has provided here. Um, we also send you a brief survey that will help us continue to serve you. We've been posting um, some things in the chat as we go along to let you know how to become a client. Again, 
again, it's no cost to you, um, but you get the services of um, our consultants that include um, people like Allison and Chris. And so you um, can tap into all of those resources um, by becoming a client. And uh, Chris, if you'll just kind of let everybody know how to find us from this point forward. Right. And Amy, you've been posting a lot in the chat. So you guys have those links in there. But again, just to remind you of a full listing um, of our workshops, you can go to sbtdc.uark.edu. And you can also just scan the, the QR code right there on your screen to get more information and to sign up for notifications. But please um, don't forget, we are all over social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We're constantly, um, we've got a great marketing team that is constantly putting information out there on the social media platform. So make sure to visit us there too. But um, thank you guys all again. And Allison, thank you so much. Um, for all this great information. We have so enjoyed it. Even with the glitches, we, we so enjoyed and, and learned a lot from this. But um, we will see everybody next time. Thank you so Thank much, you everybody. Thank you. Thanks much. Thanks, guys.